Welcome to When Football Began Again, the podcast that takes a nostalgic look at the Premier League era. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of When Football Began Again, the podcast that takes a nostalgic look at the Premier League era. Joining me today is a former player in the first season of the Premier League and later a manager with Barnsley and Sheffield Wednesday, Danny Wilson. Danny Wilson joins me on the show. We're going to chat scoring in a Wembley Cup final. We're going to talk taking a team against the odds in Barnsley up into the Premier League, very nearly surviving there, and then moving to their rival, Sheffield Wednesday, a club where he was a hero and eventually would get the sack for the very first time. We talk about his star player, Paolo Di Canio, pushing over referee Paul Alcock and the huge difference that made on his fortunes at Hillsborough. Our chat is coming up in a moment. Before we get to that, if you are a Sheffield Wednesday fan listening to this show, we did have a great show, Deserted Island Matches, with Joe Rawson last week. Something in there for you. And if you are a Barnsley fan, uh, we are covering... Barnsley in next week's show in our countdown to the all-time Premier League table. So do hang around for more details on that after my chat with Danny. But let's get into it. Extra time with Danny Wilson. Enjoy. Joining me today to discuss their career in football is former Sheffield Wednesday and Barnsley manager in his Premier League days and a few other clubs that we're going to come to as well. Danny Wilson. Danny, thank you for joining me. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today. Really, really looking forward to chatting to you more and finding out more about your career. We're going to come on to your managerial career shortly. Let's start with your playing career. So you started out with your hometown club, Wigan, before moving up the league ladder with Bury and Chesterfield. You played under Brian Clough at Nottingham Forest, spent four seasons on the South Coast with Brighton in the second tier. And when you were 27, you joined Luton in the top flight, where you went on to play a huge part in their League Cup win in 1988 against Arsenal, scoring the late goal that took the game into extra time. We'll come on to your other visits to Wembley in a second, but to play in a cup final at Wembley, to finish on the winning side, to score a goal that makes that happen, most people dream of that happening to them. Can you even begin to describe how that felt? It's very difficult to put into words, isn't it? Um, um, the adjectives, I don't think, have too many of them, really. It's, it's just an, um, a moment of sheer beauty, if I'm honest. It was absolutely magnificent to, to explain it. It's very difficult, but... How can I say? There's plenty of, of people who say that you, you, you let her stand on end when, when you hear things and, and when you do certain things. But when I scored uh, the goal at Wembley, the, the, the equalising goal against Arsenal, the crowd went bananas and the noise was just amazing. And that's the moment that I felt those hairs on the back of my neck stand up. And it's um, it just, I, I don't know, I just, I just can hear the roar. That's that's more than anything. It's... it's um, Although you know the uh, the the, uh, the steering was split between the two sets of fans very equally, um, it just said, it said like there was, there was ten times more of our fans there than the national fans at that time. It was a, it was an enormous moment for us, obviously. But the um, the noise that's something that will I will never ever forget. You know the um, it was absolutely deafening. I'd never come across really that before. We'd had cheering in that before, of course. Getting walking out to Wembley was always that, but but that noise when we equalised was 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 something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Incredible. And from yeah. from Luton, you joined Sheffield Wednesday in 1990. Yeah. You won another League Cup against Manchester United. Those familiar foes, Arsenal, would thought you twice in both the League and FA Cup finals of 1993. It's also during this period in your top flight career, um, you win 24 caps for Northern Ireland as well, scoring once. It's a fantastic playing career. It really takes off as well in that second half. There's those cup finals, those top flight appearances, international <coughs> football. Did your career just really felt as well like it was gathering that momentum? as you went through it and what, what do you put that down to? You know, I was very fortunate really um, throughout my career, starting with the days in, in Wigan and, and then on to Bury. It seemed to be that every club that I went to seemed to be a step up and a step up in the league or, or a step up in quality in the team that I was joining. And that, and that was very fortunate from my point of view. Is sometimes you, you have backward steps and you, you, you know, you go into teams who haven't got the players that you've been used to and what have you. But I was very fortunate. I went, you know, like I said, everything was a stepping stone for me. And the quality of player that I was, I was going to play with in, in the in the clubs that I was going, I was about to join, you know, were a, were a little bit of cut above what I was just left. So I'm very fortunate in that respect. And and that was as well with managers as well. You know, I had some very good managers at that time. 
all very, very uh, talented in their own rights and, and all wanted to play football in the, in the right manner, which suited me down to the ground. And um, so I was, I was very fortunate in, in that respect that uh, some of my choices, you know, to go to certain clubs were, were the ones that played out. Yeah, and that's re- well reflected as well in terms of your your managerial style and the free flowing attacking football that you brought to many teams. Just just on the on the very end of your playing career, you're actually uh, playing in the very first season of what is the rebranded Premier League, and you make 26 appearances, scoring twice in that season. Obviously, during your career and your playing career, you've seen the game uh, changing at a pace towards that advent of the Premier League. Was there a real noticeable difference with that transition from? the old first division to the Premier League as you saw it as a player? Yes and no. I think I think the playing side of it wasn't dissimilar to to the old first division really. Um you know there was a lot of there's a lot of um water out of under the bridge to get to what it is today. What we did find was was I think the um, the profile of the players and the profile of the football clubs were, were getting bigger and better and, and going further across reaches of, of Europe if you like and um, the T V obviously made a lot of players and very famous players as well and made a lot of money as you can imagine. I think the only thing that changed from us is is, is possibly the, the advertis- advertising of, of of certain uh makes of boots or drinks or, or whatever maybe or shirts it's on your on your logo on your shirts and things like that. I think they were the, the ones the, the main things and then obviously the, the fixture days, you know, they, they started to change from uh, an, a normal run of the mill Saturday afternoon. And you get one on a Sunday, maybe sometimes, or maybe you know during the week or whatever. There, there were just a small changes at first, and so it didn't really, it didn't really affect us uh, you know, too much, if I'm honest. And then the the big marketing campaign that you mentioned, and just behind me here, so this is the famous photo of a representative from all of the uh, Foundation Premier League clubs. David Hurst, your old teammate, is representing Sheffield Wednesday. Were you were you ever in the running for that one? Can you remember that conversation, that PR campaign to kind of you know it's a whole new ball game? Do you remember yeah. all of that? I do remember it, yeah, very very much so. Yeah, and um, I mean, Hershey was um, was was an absolute superstar in, in fairness, and that's why he was picked. You know, he was a, he was a massive crowd favourite of uh, Sheffield Wednesday, and he had a few um, a few um, people courting him outside of the football club as well. You know, in, in terms of management and other football clubs, so um, it was just an obvious choice, I presume, from Dave to to choose David to uh, to go on that promo. You joined Barnsley in 1993, so you start as player assistant manager, supporting your old teammate Viv Anderson. It's a yeah. tricky first season. Viv leaves for Middlesbrough. You take over and immediately guide the Tigers to sixth place. Now, at that time, that was their best ever finish since the 1920s, and you only missed out on a playoff place in the Premier League because the Premier League's reduced in numbers at that time. 95-96, you take Barnsley to 10th, and in 96-97, you're among the bookies' favourites to go down. Instead, you guide Barnsley to automatic promotion into the top flight for the first time in their history. At what point of that season did you think, do you know what, we're in with a real chance here? I'll be, I'll be very honest with you, I, it was the first game of the season and um, Eric Wynn Stanley, who was, um, who was my assistant manager and a, and, a, and a fantastic coach, great fellow, and we sadly miss him. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a, a year or so ago. And Eric, uh, we, we went to West Brom and we played at West Brom and um, we, we, we started the game very, very brightly. But as the game went on, we went. We, we looked really strong and we looked full of energy. Um, we were creating chances. Uh, we looked very, very solid at the back. We ended up winning the game, and I walked off the pitch and I said to Eric, "I said, you know what, Eric, this this could be our season, you know." And Eric just said, "Shut up, you idiot." It was the first game of the season, <laughs> so uh, he didn't take my uh, he didn't take my um, uh, thoughts of, um, with him in that respect. But it was it was. Pleasantly surprised, like I was, how well we played. But um, as we all know, you have to get consistency with it as well. And so, uh, but I say that um, it, it, uh, it was that first game. It, it really, really opened my eyes with, because they were a new team as well, and they they, they just sort of blended straight away, which we we found very, very um, unusual. Um, we usually take a little while, but every single player just slotted in straight away. It was great. Fast forward into the end of that season, so that famous day, Bradford City, and when you did take Barnsley into yeah. the Premier League, we've talked about you scoring a goal in a cup final. I mean, obviously, you, you, it's a new experience for you as a manager, and you're having this sensational success. How did that feel when that whistle went and you knew that you'd guided Barnsley to the top flight? You know, the, the emotions were, were running very, very high with everybody. It was, it, it, it was a, a massive joint effort. To, to get um, to Barnsley to where they were at, that, at the end of that game. 
as you can imagine, it, I mean, it, there's lots of things being reported. I mean, you might have read it before as well, but, you know, Burnsley's itself as a town at that time were having tough times. You know, and there was a lot of unemployment. The pits were closing down. Um, people just didn't have money. So they had to, or they wanted a little bit of respite, I suppose, at times, and they started to come and watch the football, which was great. You know, from our point of view, you know, we'd had a tough time as well, you know, getting people in the stadium and the Taylor Report, which was um, well documented at that time with um, with a seat in and people had to be seat seated. And the football club, you know, hadn't really got that sort of money to, to delve into um, to upgrading the stadium, but they had to, they had to find the money somehow. You know, and lo and behold, you know, everybody just sort of, sort of blended together and really pulled together as um, as the season went on. And then the last day, the last game, and when when obviously we, we we found out we we got that ticket to the promised land, if you like, it was it was absolutely amazing. I've, I've never seen so many people so happy. And it wasn't just the football; it was everything that accumulated as well. You know, we 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 went, used to go into the community all the time, the players and, and the staff, and it, it just felt like they were one of us and we were one of them. You know, we didn't get above our station. You know, we, we knew you know, how tough it was in, in the town itself. And, and I think that respect went all the way through, through the players and the people of the club and also to the people in the community as well. An incredible achievement and, and as you say, at a time when, when things, were, things were tough. And I've actually spoken to a few Barnsley fans, including Ian McMillan on this show, actually, famous Barnsley fan. And they all say the same thing about that opening day of the Premier League season against West Ham. The, they describe it as almost like an out-of-body experience, like it didn't feel real. And actually, as fans describing that a little bit, almost the way you you describe in your your goal at Wembley. I mean, as a, you, you've been in football uh, as a player for a long time at this point, but you're a new manager. How did it feel <laughs> leading your team out at Oakwell on that first day in that kind of carnival atmosphere against West Ham? Oh, a very proud, a very proud moment. And um, and like you say again, you know, the, you know, walking out with. Um, side of the West Ham United team who who has uh, been in the Premiership for a long, long time. You know, very, very uh, high stature in the game. And, and to come out and play, you know, then in the first game at home was was a, was a massive, massive lift for everybody. And, you know, you couldn't get a seat in the stadium. And, you know, I, I think it was sold out most games, I would think, at home um, throughout the season. But um, the one thing that really stuck out more than anything was walking out and then seeing the size of the West Ham players against the players that we had that really opened my eyes we you know even i didn't say anything to anybody i just walked out and i thought cracky this is a big side this is a a team who, who struggled a little bit last year in the premier league uh, the, the season before in the premier league and we got them you know at, at what people thought was a was a good time to get them really because it, you know nobody expected them to um to, to do anything in the in the premier league and expect him to be struggling at the bottom so we thought you know and everybody thought i think it, this is, if we can get three points here, like you know, or we will get three points here. And sadly, it didn't work out that way. But um, it, that that opened my eyes, and the, and the way the game went opened my eyes a lot as well. You know that um, this was going to be a tough season, and um, and some of our lads as well. I think you know we just brought them back down to earth a little bit. You know, against a team that was not very very well fancied, and they turned us over at home. So we had um, we had a lot of thoughts to put into in the coming weeks and, and the coming months. But um, that was a real eye opener for us. Although it was a fantastic day. Yeah, kind car of atmosphere. I think you, you you took the lead. West Ham did go on to win the game, but a few days later, you do get your first win at Crystal Palace, and there it came up with you. You also win at Bolton. There's a famous victory up at Anfield as well. Um, there are a few heavy defeats in there too. By Christmas, it's looking a little bit ominous. But after Christmas, you win five of your next ten games, starting on Boxing Day, to put yourselves within a few points of safety. Do you put that down to the players getting used to their surroundings? Obviously, you brought a few players in. That runner form that you go on after Christmas really puts you firmly back in the mix. What do you put that down to, and how do you remember that period? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about finding your feet, and I think. In the games that we've been in, you're right, there's was, there was a few heavy defeats, but there's also some very, very close games as well, which we couldn't really push over the line in our favour. And um, so we, we, as the season went on, we were, we were starting to stop looking at the other teams with with the respect that we we had been doing and i say that in the nicest way we went out there we went toe to toe with them and you know rather than you know being in awe of them you know we started to to find our feet in, and, and our, our own belief as well and uh, and i think that's why one of the reasons that we started putting a few results together coupled with obviously one or two extra players that we had coming in over that period but um you know it's sometimes it, it 
you can leave it a bit too late, I think. You know, so we were chasing all the time, chasing all season. That's that's uh, that's always going to be difficult. Um, but we did. We we gave ourselves a, a little bit of hope there and uh, in that period. And that that period, you you you're very much in the form table. You're in the in the top half very comfortably. There is a, a match that that kind of is quite pivotal in this season. You perhaps know the one I'm going to talk about, but I'll give some context. It's fair to say maybe referee Gary Willard hasn't been spotted in Barnsley since March 1998. <laughs> if anyone doesn't know the story, Barnsley faced Liverpool at well, looking to complete the double over their opponents and off the back of three straight wins as well. You go ahead through Neil Redfern, Carl Heinz Riedler equalisers, Darren Barnard is sent off for clipping the heels of a teenage Michael Owen and Riedler puts Liverpool in the lead soon after. It's then when things uh, get a little bit interesting. Chris Morgan is sent off for a supposed elbow of Michael Owen, which incenses the crowd and a fan does enter the pitch, which means that Willard takes both teams off the pitch for five full minutes as a result. Now, what are your reflections on that day? Can you remember what you said to your team? And let's face it, what was an impromptu team talk that you hadn't anticipated? You're down to nine men at that point. What What are your memories of that particular afternoon? Well, the memories are, it, it's, 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 you took something straight away, it was sending off, you know, I think, up against one of the, the best teams in Europe at that time. They're coming to our place, we'd had a good result at, at Anfield, a very lucky one, I have to say. We, we won, you know, and we, we, we defended quite well. Got a bit lucky, but we defended our goal very well. Um, and then bringing them back to our place, and I knew there was, there was going to be a, a, a totally different game than it was um, at Anfield. The, the, the episodes and the incidents that happened throughout the game, you know, they do define certain results in the future as well. And I think it defined a lot of, of our results after that because we lost players, uh, important players, for two, two or three games um, after that, which um, you can't afford to do that. We need to have a squad big enough to carry it. But I think the decisions, Gary, you know, Mr. Willard, I think he's, um, he's well retired now. I'm sure a lot of you will be remembering the game. He'll, he'll want to put that behind him, I think. It's not something I don't think he'll, he'll want to remember. Because I thought they were poor decisions at the time. They, and they all went in the favour of Liverpool. Um, Chris Morgans was, a, was, was, was one that really incensed me as well. Because all he did is put his arm across a striker who was trying to get the ball. And, and they just protected the ball. Michael Wayne went down very easily. You know, and uh, that was... Again, after Darren Barnard's trip on him prior to that, which was maybe maybe a you know a booking maybe, but you were not sending offs. And um, but what he did, it it, um, it incensed everybody really, and and not just myself as well. You know, Roy Evans, who was manager of um, of Liverpool at the time, he, we spoke and you know during the game and, and certainly after it, and we just we couldn't believe what he was seeing. So you know, although it helped his team and it helped them win the game. Although that was still close, you know, later on with with um, with a goal that, that won it three two. I think with um, with Roy as well, he was he was just delighted that he came and got something out of the game. Although although we were down to eight men at the time, you know, it was uh, it was ridiculous. And but the referee completely looked, from from my pers- perspective, watching it um, and thinking back about it, he just lost the plot. He he completely just I don't know I don't know what he was seeing. He was just. It, it was too rash in his decisions. It was very rash when he took the teams off as well. One uh, person came on the pitch. Yes, we did, and he was dealt with. Well, it was it was there was no one to take the players off at all. And and again, I said that just it just incensed all the fans as well. Yeah, and as, you, as you've already touched upon, I mean, when the game gets underway, you win a penalty with five minutes to go. Neil Redfern converts it. You've you've pulled it back to two two. And again, the noise in Oakwell when you watch that back is absolutely incredible. It's it's like a cup final. <laughs> Unfortunately, Steve McManaman does score a last minute winner. Uh, Darren Sheridan gets a second yellow uh, in the melee. I think that follows losing three two with eight men on on the pitch. That momentum. I mean, it's a really interesting point that it's actually just losing those players afterwards in the games to follow that actually that when that game has finished you've then got to pick a team uh, the following game without three of your players do you as a manager move on from the night minutes quite quickly but go this is the problem that I've now got in the post to deal with is that kind of your main focus well it is I mean the first thing you're thinking of straight away is the next game and, and who's going to be available to you you know and um, and what sort of, of uh, dynamic you, you need in the team and, and who you're playing against um, and that was that was Addressed versus after the game, you know, and so we, Eric and I would always, always go and have a, a, a cup of tea afterwards and then just discuss the game, obviously, but then again, looking forward because you're not going to change what's just happened. But we'd had a um, complimentary cup of tea with um, with uh, Liverpool staff and then we, we go in, um, 
in our own little corner and we, and we discussed what we can do. That's virtually straight away. And that was difficult because we, you know, we just didn't know one or two players, you know, whether they could, they could play in the Premier League, you know, given the, the opportunity. So we were just about to find out. And in the penultimate game of the season, after a heroic campaign, uh, you do go down alongside Bolton and Palace, who are the two teams that you come up with as well. It does feel at this, at this stage that the gap between the Premier League and the First Division, or the Championship as it's known now, is beginning to widen. Did you sort of feel that, that maybe money was coming into it a little bit to the point where it was becoming ever more difficult for newly promoted teams to, to, to maintain that position? Well, it was, yeah. I mean, I, I think I've touched on before that... Um... David May, who was, um, was a Blackburn Rovers player at the time, he'd gone to Manchester United for, I think it was about £5 million. Our team hadn't had heard it cost that. You know, it was, that, that's the difference. And um, so money was a big a big issue. And we had to remember as well that the money the Premier League, uh, the clubs got from the Premier League would, would generally go back into the playing side of it. But we were, we were um, going to do that. You know, the board in the wisdom, you know, they needed to leave a legacy. And uh, the training ground needed doing the... the, the the uh, stadium needed upgrading, um, and they decided that you know that was a priority, and rightly so as well. You know, I've, I had no argument with that whatsoever. And, uh, and John Dennis and his, and his board of directors did a fabulous job in in, um, in in doing what they did, which was under pressure as well, really, because everyone was shouting at them and wanting them to stay in the Premier League and go and buy players and this that, and the other. But you know, there was a very fine line between both, and, and I think you know from the money side of it, you know, that's when we started to see it grow and grow. One of the yeah. highlights we haven't touched on of that season, actually, of 97-98, <coughs> is your FA Cup run, which does actually also coincide with that really good run in the league of form as well. So you beat relegation rival Spurs in a replay. Uh, you were lucky to only get a draw at Old Trafford, and uh, you know that's a ground that, that you'd lost at in the league a few months earlier. When you bring Man United back to Oakwell for the replay, a famous Scott Jones brace uh, leads to a very famous night at Oakwell, and again, you watch that back on YouTube and listen to the cheers as, as Scott Jones bullets that header in. Take me back to that night, and again, when that final whistle goes, you, you knock out Manchester United, who are a, are a superpower at that point as well. We'll go back even further than that. When we went to Old Trafford in the first um, the first uh, leg of that one, or the, or the, the, the original game, uh, drawn away at Manchester United is not an easy place to go to, and you think, crack, well, you know, the club might get a few quid out of it. You know, it's going to be a big crowd, we know that. Um, let's just go and do the best that we possibly can. And uh, coming away from there with a one-one draw was a big disappointment for us because we should have we should have had a penalty in the in the final minutes of the game when Andy Little went through. Uh, it was brought down, you know, in uh, unbelievable fashion. I can't believe the referee, uh, this uh, even looking back at it now, could not see a penalty there because the whole of Stratford End could see it. You know, and they they were just holding their breath. They come, they just waited for the whistle to go, and and the referee to point to to the penalty spot. But Gary Neville, who, who committed the, the foul, you know, had a big sigh of relief, and uh, and you know, final whistle went, and we thought, well, at least we've got a, we've got another crack at it. But nobody expected us to 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 have that type of performance again. At, oh well, and uh, and yet we did. And um, yeah, you're right. It was it was a special evening, you know. And, and young Scotty, I don't think I think that'll be one of his memories to the. So he goes to his uh, to his grave. No, it was it was brilliant, great night, great night. But the the big thing for us was the Premier League, you know. And uh, yes, it was great, lovely distraction, um, great for the fans to have something to shout about. Um, but we still had a job to do in the league. So, so moving on to the following season, so you joined Sheffield Wednesday that summer, you replace your old boss Ron Atkinson there, so return yeah. to your old club, who slowly slipped closer and closer to the relegation zone during the Premier League era. There's um, a, a, a response from Barnsley fans, obviously you are leaving for their rivals, but I think any fair-minded fan would say you've earned the move, you've achieved the impossible by taking them there, you've very nearly achieved it again by keeping them there. How was that decision in terms of, from an emotional point of view, Barnsley to Sheffield Wednesday, but obviously returning to your old club? Well, listen, we, we, we've been through a great deal at, at Barnsley, as, as I've just said, and, you know, and you've highlighted you know, uh, very, very well. You know, that um, you know, those years, there were special years for me and, and, and special years for the, for the club and the, and the town. But I'd, I'd already known um, a lot of people at, at Sheffield Wednesday. I knew the, the, uh, the people upstairs. I knew a lot of the players. Um, I had a good time as a player there as well. So, you know, they, they were special memories for me. Um, and I phoned on Ron Atkinson up when I knew that um, I was told that, that I could speak to them. I spoke to Ron. Ron guaranteed, he said, you, you've got to go there, Dan. He said, you know everybody, you know what the club's about. 
great club, big club. You know, you know, it's it's up to you, but you you sometimes don't get two opportunities, and that's what it was basically. Uh, and I've highlighted many times before that any other club, I don't think I would have done. Mm. But it was it was just too much from my point of view of, of a of a decision of, of to turn it down. I just couldn't. I just couldn't force myself to say no. A lot of people did got disappointed at Barnsley, that's for sure, and thought that I was a traitor and I was, I was leaving. But I thought, you know, you know, we've, we've had a great you know, stay together for the, the, the three years that we did, three and a bit years, and um, I, I left with my head held high. But I still think it was, you know, a lot of, a lot of the fans were still against against me going there. And it's always, you know, tribal in football. It, it's that there's there's that difficulty. But I mean, you you go into uh, Sheffield Wednesday, uh, fin- finish a very comfortable twelfth in your first season. Arsenal, Liverpool, and the eventual treble winners, Manchester United all come to Hillsborough that season and leave empty handed so some, some really uh, big wins there in your time your cause of course isn't helped when you lose Paolo Di Canio arguably your star player to an 11 game ban for pushing over Paul Alcock in uh, what turns into his last game for the club as well uh, before being sold to West Ham Again, it's another one of those moments where, as a fan, you know these are iconic moments of the Premier League. You are there, stood right in the middle of it. What goes through your mind on the touchline when you see your player do something like that? Maybe talk us through what happens in the weeks ahead when, obviously, he he has received his ban and eventually do, does leave the football club. Um, yeah, well, the very uncertain times, you know, like you say, you you've got one of your best players and one of the best players in the Premier League who's absent. You can't. You, we couldn't get him back into the country. Paulo himself, he'll say, you know, he had, he had uh, medical uh, certificates to say that he wasn't in the right frame of mind to come back, and um, depression was setting in, etc. Um, you know, you can't argue with that. You, you've got to, uh, you know, understand it and, um, and and get on with it. At that meantime, I was trying to get him back. We had a, we had a job of trying to get some results as well, you know, which was never very easy when you when you're missing, like I say, you star you, you star player. So um, yeah, it was it was very difficult, a very difficult period. Everybody. Outside of the, um, of the of the club itself, I mean, from upstairs and maybe the management, you know, were the ones who knew what was going on. The rest of the fans didn't, and it was very difficult to get it out to them. You know that um, we couldn't we couldn't go out public and, and say what was going on. The chairman at the time, Dave Richard, had said that because um, because he was the chairman of, of the Premier League, he had an agreement with all the chairmen that nobody would touch Paolo, and that we would retain his his registration. So if he did go anywhere, go abroad, and you know, they get a fee for him. And then, lo and behold, you know, a player that was valued maybe around about anything between five and eight million pound, he goes for one point something million pound to to West Ham, and that was a big kicking, you know, that in the in the uh, proverbials really, um, because we'd lost a, a, a great player for for pittance, and again, you know, the words of of the the chairman, which was allegedly said, uh, had not been come to fruition, you know, that uh, somebody had taken a gamble on him, and you can't blame him for that. You can't blame somebody to get. <laughs> A quality player like that at a, at a cheap price. So, um, but it was a big, uh, big hit for us. I think from from where we were, uh, we had no money as well. We couldn't, we couldn't go out to replace him. Even that money that was that was given to pa- from Paolo was not available to us. So, um, you know, you not only have you lost somebody, you can't replace them. As a manager, I mean, that's a that's a fascinating <coughs> insight as well of actually losing a star player and actually losing them for a fee that means that you can't really re- reinvest back into your squad to bring in a like for like. Talk, talk me through that kind of process of when you're shortlisting players, when you're looking to bring in new players. How does that work and how how many get away from you before you manage to get one over the line and start sign a player at that level of, of, of English football? Well, there's lots get away, that's for sure. I mean, you've got to remember we're not Manchester United, you know, we're not, we're not Liverpool. Where we were in the, in the league, you know, struggling away, which I had been the year before as well and, and, and what have you. So, if you're wanting top players, not only have you got to play top books, top uh, fees for them, you've got to entice them to come. That's the hardest part. You know, they look at the, um, at the the league and think, well, am I going to a club that's going to be struggling? I don't want I don't want to be the team that's going to be losing every week. You know, or having a struggle and getting results. So, you know, it's not just about, you know, identifying the players. It's actually getting them over the line. We can identify the players quite easily with, with the, um, the scouting system we have and had. So that to identify them was simple. But the hardest part was getting them over the line. And then, obviously, this, that comes because you, the club's not got a great deal of money, mm. it comes with wages. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to entice them. If you, if you think you're going to be in a, in a relegation battle, you know, and then you say to them, well, if we get relegated, you don't have a, a 20% pay 
cutting your wages and say, no, thanks very much, we're not, we're not signing that. And off they go and you look for the next one. You keep looking for the next one, but they're not as good as the one before. You know, and um, the ones that you do get in and you, you can afford, you know, that um, they're, not, they're not the quality of the, of the calibre of the player that you're really liking. Yeah, so again, it's really about that momentum, I think, then, isn't it? Of what you're saying, actually, if you begin to struggle and relegation clauses become a factor in Oops. contracts and so on, that becomes a problem. Well, it does. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It still happens now. I bet you can sit any manager down now and, and maybe taking away the top clubs. You know, the ones that are mid table and, and below and have been for a few seasons, you know, they'll have to implement something like that in, in contracts. And with agents and, and the players themselves, they're very reluctant to, to sign something with. With those clauses in there, you know, and if it if they are, if they are doing something like that, then they'll try and have a say on what the fee is going to be if they release them, you know. So it's um, it's difficult for clubs in in that respect in um, in, in tight plays, you know, particularly if you're a mid table club. It's a difficult second season, especially without De Canio. You're replaced by Paul Jewell. Obviously, the sack is an occupational hazard of a football manager. This is your first experience of it, six years into a career that's had many highs so far. How do you reflect on that spell at Sheffield Wednesday? And also, just almost on a human level, I mean, we touched upon it with Paolo Di Canio. Losing your job is, is a difficult thing for any football manager, but obviously you have to have that thick skin. But how do you, how do you reflect on that on a human level and deal with something like that? Well, the, the first one, obviously, is, is your pride that's dented. You know, it's, um, it's your, if you, you know, you're, you're new into management, um, you know, you, you think you, you, you're doing everything right and this and then you get sacked. And you're obviously not doing the things correctly that you think you're doing. Uh, but what, what more than anything, it's your pride. You know, you don't know what you're going to do. Am I going to get another job? Is someone going to look, look and, and employ me again? I don't know. Have I done enough to, you know, to, to warrant going to another football club and, and try and, you know, to, uh, to, to make a way there. So there's lots of things you, 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 you question yourself, you, you look at yourself, you, you know, and, and all the things you've done before. And it's, um, it's very tough. It's very tough. You, the first time in particular is very tough, but the time at Sheffield Wednesday was tough as well, you know, and, and I think, I don't think at the time I was helped as much as I should have been helped. Um, and that's what disappointed me more than anything. I'd, not only I'd lost, lost my job, but I didn't get any help, you know, in, in, uh, in trying to, to, um, to get the results on the pitch that, that we needed. Um, and it's not all about one person. So it wasn't all about me. You know, it's, a, it's about a group of people, either upstairs and on the pitch as well. Um, and if you pull in the same direction, as I was talking about before with Barnsley, you can achieve things. But if you've got, um, if you've got areas where they're not pulling or, they're, or they're, they're, uh, the, the poles apart from, from whatever reason, then you're going to have problems. And that's what disappointed me more than anything at Sheffield Wednesday. Everybody wasn't pulling the same way. And very yeah. difficult because you're the man. You're you're the man in the spotlight that's got to face up to the press, face up to face yeah. up to everything, haven't you? Well, I don't mind that. That's that's part and parcel of my job. I'm not. I'm, I don't shy away from things like that. That's you know that's something that you you that comes with the job. You you've got to you've got to go and face things up at times. And that, I'd never never worried that. You know, but the thing that worried me more than anything was the was the uh, the conversations or the lack of conversations uh, with with people upstairs. That was the hardest part. We didn't really see anybody. We couldn't get a hold of people at times. We were important times for us. You know, we had people that was in London who were who were uh, hedge fund managers and that who were only interested in the return of the of the money. We weren't really interested in results. You know, and um, so that was that was a very tough part as well. You know, but um, no, the, the the press and and what goes with it and the fans unrest and that that's part and parcel. We have to we have to accept that's going to happen. And you're in the firing line, but I do feel. You know, I feel I felt very let down at that time. We, we talked about your international playing career. Were you ever tempted into moving into an international management? Was it was it ever on the cards? I, I was asked once. Yes, yes, I was asked. Um, I'm not too sure what year it was, if I'm honest. But I was asked once if I, I would um, consider going into international uh, management. I felt at the time I was too young. Um, I still felt that it was it's definitely a senior position, uh, uh, a senior um, player, uh, manager's position. I think that um, going in a bit too young, I felt, this is my opinion, not, you know, I'm sure it's, it's, uh, it's been done, but I just felt I had more time at club level yet and, and more time to understand what was going on at club level and, and learn my trade at that, at that um, particular level rather than at international level at the age I was at the time. I think I was just about 40, I think it was something like that. Was and it, was uh, Northern Ireland, was it? Yes, it was, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, so um, so I didn't uh, I didn't pursue it. I you know, thank him very much for the you know for the thoughts, but um, but I carried on uh, in the in the in the club scene. And your management career takes you to Bristol City, Swindon, MK Dons, Hartlepool, and a successful, if initially controversial, move to Bramall Lane. And we've kind of touched on that with the switch from from, from Barnsley to, to Sheffield Wednesday. Uh, obviously, you know you were known you were known for your time at Sheffield Wednesday. So you you had a little bit of a, a rough ride going in there, but again had had a fantastic time there with some uh, you know really really impressive league campaigns. Did you feel that over that time? You'd, you'd won over over the fan base at that time. Did they forgive you those Sheffield Wednesday links in the end? Do you think? I wouldn't say to a man, but generally, yes. I think I think we did. I think we we played some great football at the time. We very very unfortunate not, not to get a promotion um, in that period. But I thought that you know the way that we played our football, I think we won a lot of people over. And some of the players, you know, they they excelled, you know, in, in the team and when I was there, and I was very very proud of that. Yeah, but I mean, you, you can't win everybody over. You're never going to win everybody over. Still, people had had doubts because of my links with Sheffield Wednesday, which um, mm-hmm. I find you know understandable to a certain degree. But it, it is again, you know, we if you, if you look at any um, player or any manager, there's been something along the line where they've they've, they've crossed the, the line against the, the, the fans of another club. Mm-hmm. So um, it's just what it is. You've just got to get on with it and. And I've never shied away from anything, you know. It's, I, I do take the ball by the horns. It's um, a bit stupidly sometimes, but I thought going into Sheffield United, it was a, it was a great opportunity at a, at a massive football club, just like Sheffield Wednesday was. And I thought, you know, uh, what an opportunity this is. And looking at the players um, at that time, we could, you know, we could do, you know, a lot of good there with uh, with what we had. You do go back to Barnsley as well, and then and then you manage Chesterfield. Now, as it stands, I believe your final game as it stands as a manager is at Valley Parade against Bradford. I've noticed a little quirk, Danny, in your managerial career. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put this to you and see if you've noticed this. You've managed eight different teams, two spells at Barnsley. Five of your appointments were in pre-season, which is a perfectly normal time to take over a football club. However, the other four jobs you took them all in December, including in Boxing Day or Boxing Day at Swindon and, Ch- and Christmas Eve at Chesterfield. Does your wife Karen have to give you a stern look when the tree comes out of the loft each year? Still, <laughs> you hug up your managerial boots for good. Um, it, it is funny, you know. It's the the festive season in in, in most footballers' houses, particularly managers' houses, um, is slightly different than anybody else's because we we generally on call. Um, it's a very busy period for for the football clubs at that time, obviously, and um, and, and you know we 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 have many time I've just stuffed the. Uh, you know, a few uh, potatoes down my, down my throat and then shot off to training, you know, and um, missed a lot of the days. You know, we've been training on the mornings of the day, certain games, and we always play on Boxing Day. So, um, yeah, no, it's, it was nothing nothing unusual, really. I think, you know, the the uh, the axe normally comes down with a lot of managers around about that period anyway, before the new year. And, um, you know, unfortunately, that was shooting season. But, uh, but yeah, you, you, you know, you don't mind... What day it is? It could have been any day of the week, really, from from my point of view. But it just happened to to fall on that day, yeah. Yeah, and you you touched upon it there, really. I mean, yeah, Christmas is such a busy time of uh, for for football. So uh, both as a manager as a player. So, I mean, uh, have there been? I know I know you're a big family man. Has there been many Christmas days where you've actually just got to enjoy it at home? Is that something that's come in the in more recent years since you've stepped back a bit more from the game, or or or, or what was that like as a player and as a manager? Well, obviously, as a, as a as a player, you know, generally at home every all of Christmas, you know, unless we were out on the, the manager, whoever is the given manager at the time, would uh, would get you to come in, in in the morning. Some would even get you coming in the afternoon, you know, to make sure they've not had too much pudding or a few drinks <laughs> before training, you know. So um, different managers have different ones. Um, from my point of view, most of the time I used to give the boys a Christmas day off because I think. Psychologically, that's you know you you get a little bit more out of them. But some love to come in on 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 box on sorry on uh, Christmas Day as well. Train some some have asked me before can we turn it's great on Christmas Day everybody's happy and the, the silly jumpers are coming out and whatever and and um, so I, I yeah I've I've had different I've different um, opinions on the, the the Christmas Day training, but um, I generally would 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 prefer the last to stay at home. Um, which doesn't mean to say that I had to stay at home because there's still work to do at, at the football club. You know, I, I would try to be and uh, be with the family, um, certainly have, have a Christmas lunch together, 
Um, but after that, it could be anything. We could be out in, on the road anywhere. You know, and if it's an away game as well, you have to remember as well, you know, we, overnight stay away, we, you know, we'd, um, we'd go on the, on the day of Christmas Day anyway. You know, so we wouldn't be there most of the time if, it was a, if you had an away game. One thing you've got to have is a very understanding wife and family, and, and I've got I've got both. You know, they're absolutely brilliant. They've, they've supported me throughout uh, my career, both playing and managing. And it's not easy. You know, it isn't easy to be uh, to be a wife in in that situation. But um, but Karen's been absolutely brilliant for me. You know, and uh, she's supported everything that I've done. That's fantastic. I, I'm, and you've you've just shown a new light on that stat that I gave you a little bit earlier about Barnsley and the run that you went on from Boxing Day. Did you give uh, Did you give the team Christmas Day off in that Premier League season? Is this have we just tapped into one of the key secrets as to uh, how you went on that fantastic run after Christmas? Well, well, no, no, we didn't. We didn't train on Christmas Day. We were off on, on Christmas Day. But um, you know, sometimes it, it works. Sometimes it doesn't. You don't. You don't really know. You know that you have a different group of players every year, so you just wouldn't know. But but I do feel that you know if if you if if you if you look like you you're going to be in, and then the, the players look like they've they've, they've bent your ear a little bit, and then you've given in to them, they'll give you a little bit more back. And um, and I think that's uh, that, that goes anything that if they think we, I'm doing them a favour, they would normally be in. Or no, I go on and all, but you know, but you know we want a result on watching day and. And they just give a little bit extra, you know. It's, uh, although it shouldn't work that way, but it, but I'm sure it does. Yeah, no, good good management in, in football and outside of football, I'm sure that. So, yeah. Um, so, Danny, you've managed over a 1,000 games. You've played over 700 games, including in four cup finals. You've walked up the steps at Wembley to collect a winner's medal twice. You're on a list of just 20 different men who've been voted by their fellow colleagues as LMA Manager of the Year. That list includes Alex Ferguson, Arsene Wenger, Jurgen Klopp and Pep Guardiola, which I'm sure you'll agree is not a bad list to be on. I don't know, what looking from an outside looking in, how you begin to pick that highlights from a career like that but for you what are the memories what's your Scott Jones moments that you'll take <laughs> with you to your grave um, it, it, Carl it's a, diff, it's a difficult one to say because every club that, that I've, I've been fortunate enough to manage in particular um, have had the problems or, or they've had the, 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 the success you know it, and, and sometimes when you when you pick a club up you know, you know by, by the scuff of the neck and They've had, they've had problems or they get relegated or whatever it may be and you've, you've helped them to survive that and then help them to survive financially as well is, is a massive, massive boost from from a manager's point of view. Although it's not seemed to be successful, you know, because you've not won anything. But for me, it's, it's, it's great. So the few clubs that, that have managed to do that are, are up there as well, you know, where, where we've um, managed to survive Swindon in, you know, in, in one of the um, ways we're talking about. Um, Bristol City, we turned them round as well. I think from that point of view, you know, I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. But the standout one is had to be Barnsley because it was against all the odds. And, you know, I don't think maybe something like that will ever happen again. You know, um, and, I, and I just think that's because of the, the, how big the, the, uh, the prize is you now in the championship. Teams are throwing extortionate money at uh, trying to get to that, you know, the golden egg type of thing. And, and I don't think the smaller clubs can, can compete with that. You know, the big clubs who have been there uh, will generally be the ones who are fighting for those positions again. But somewhere in there where, where there's a, I don't know, maybe Burton Albion someday, you know, will they find it difficult? Yeah, they will. Everybody will find it difficult to a small club. Yeah, no, an incredible achievement. And, mm. uh, and yeah, a, a, well... A wonderful, a wonderful sort of season in in the sun that you uh, that you gave Barnsley that year, following that incredible promotion season. Uh, Danny, it's been a pleasure talking to you and getting an insight into your career. You've written a book about your life and career, haven't you? It's called "I Get Knocked Down But I Get Up Again." Tell us a bit more about that, how it came about, and, and where people can get hold of it. Um, well, you can get hold of it uh, online. Actually, it's um, Morgan Lawrence who are the um, uh, the publishers. Uh, Matthew Mann was the is the the guy who did the ghostwriting for me, but it came about. I've been asked on numerous occasions if I would do something like that, but I'm I'm, I'm not that type of person really. I'm, I'm quite a, a private lad, you know. And a lot of stuff when I've left football clubs, you know, there's been reasons spurted about, you know, this that and the other, and, and it's not been correct. But I've just got over there. Just well, they can say what they want, you know. I can't really, you know, I'm not really changing any people's opinions. But the actual truths of, of certain situations, you know, I felt had to, to come out. And that was only because I sat down with, with Karen and and, uh, and the kids and uh, I said I'd been asked to to do a book. 
but it's nothing to do with with all the you know the the fans really. It's it's some, a bit of a legacy for my two new grandchildren, and he just said you know the granddad won't know you know what I did. He might know I was a footballer, but they'll only see me in a football kit or or a shirt and tie. Like, you know, and uh, they just wanted to do a few stories and and Laurie and Carrie, my, my son and daughter, there's a few stories that they hadn't heard. So they said, well, why not give it a go, Dad? You know, I said, it's, it's not about, you know, this is not about a money-making thing. It's certainly far from it. But, um, but it's, it's, it is a, a real, real eye-opener from one or two situations that people may not have, have realised of what happened at certain clubs. Um, and a few nice, funny stories as well. So, you know, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, I'll, I'll remember forever uh, and something that I can pass on to, to my grandchildren. Fantastic. Well, it uh, sounds a fantastic read to get an insight into just some of the moments that we've uh, we've covered today. And yeah, thanks to thanks to the advent of things like YouTube, those those grandkids are going to be watching watching these things from. It's going to live forever. You know that Barnsley season and and so many of those things. With it, it must be fantastic reflecting as a former player and a manager that you have given those moments to the Barnsley fans, to the Luton fans, to the countless other fans, the Swindon fans, what you know, that what a legacy to, to leave in football because we all love it so much, don't we? And there are tough times, yeah. but those those highs that you mentioned, they, they will live forever, won't they? Well I'm with me as well. Don't forget, you know, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm I'm not just doing it for everybody else, I'm doing it for ourselves as well. And they're great memories from my point of view. And even at times when, you know, things didn't go particularly well, you know, this it's not something that's ever Diminish my, my love for the clubs that I've, I've, I've worked with, you know. So um, even though you know you don't get the results, you don't you don't finish the season where you want to finish it, you know. It, it still doesn't mean you know you don't have a, a feeling for that particular uh, club. And I've been very very fortunate that you know I've had the opportunity to to represent a lot of football clubs up and down the country, and um, they're, 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 those memories will last with, for me uh, forever for, in, in my mind because I've been very very privileged. Danny Wilson, thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure to talk to you. That's great, Carl. Thank you. So that was Danny Wilson, a lovely, lovely man. I couldn't quite get out of him whether he plans to come back into a dugout again uh, before too long. It, he seems pretty happy with life at the moment and, and life after football treating him quite well. I've put a link for his book in the description of this show as well. Uh, I found the Decanio stuff really interesting, a real sliding doors moment. Had he kept that player at top form? Had he still gone on and sold him and replaced him like for like at his market value? Who knows? Maybe his time at Sheffield Wednesday may have ended differently, but fascinating insight into the difference that that made to him and his career at Sheffield Wednesday. So as I mentioned at the start of the show, if you're a Wednesday fan, my chat with Joe Rawson last week was a a really interesting one. Plenty in there, particularly for Wednesday fans. If you're a Barnsley fan, Ian McMillan was on the show in our second episode uh, of Deserted Island Matches. And you are featured again in the all-time Premier League table countdown next week. 49th place, it's Barnsley. If you do have any memories of that season in 97, 98 that you want to share with me, please get in touch. My email is when football began again at gmail.com or find us on the socials and drop me a message there. I'd love to share your memories of that special season for Barnsley Football Club. They're one and only at the time of recording in the English top flight. Your votes have gone towards another player being added to the Premier League of Nations and Belarus have a representative. It is Alexander Hleb with 82% of the vote, which is probably more of a close run thing than it ought to have been. Alexander Hleb, 82% of the vote. He is now in our Premier League of Nations Hall of Fame. On next week's show, we'll be selecting the greatest Austrian with my guests, comedian and Barnsley fan Pete Selwood and editor of On the Ponty End, Ian Wilkinson. They will be helping me choose the greatest Austrian. They'll also be chatting all things Barnsley, their route to the Premier League, the story behind how they very nearly became a top flight side over a century ago that didn't quite happen and had to wait until the 90s for their chance at the top table. 
A really, really fun show. A great chat. But that is it for this week. Thank you so much, as always, for sharing the show, for leaving your comments on our posts. It really helps in terms of spreading the word. If you've listened to a few episodes now and you're enjoying it, I'd love it if you left a review with just a few lines about what you enjoy about the show and why. I'd really appreciate that wherever you get your podcasts. Or just subscribe on our YouTube channel. Or do both. Help spread the word and help us find more people for this show. That is it though for this week. Join me again next week for our return to the countdown of the all-time Premier League table, 49th place. It is Barnsley Football Club. It's a cracker. See you then. Thanks for listening to When Football Began Again. Join us again next time for another slice of Premier League nostalgia. In the meantime, subscribe, Leave us a five-star review, find us on socials, and spread the word with all your Premier League-loving mates.